ready to start. I think Good. so. Okay, I think great. So. <laughs> Carrie, I'm, I'm mystified by this PC. By, I, by the PC, how do I get it to display? I have we'll get you used to what? Are we good? Welcome, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey. Um, welcome to the second annual Open SUNY Coat Summit. Um, I'm going to make a, a longer welcome uh, in a little bit, but first I'd like to uh, introduce Carrie Hatch, the Associate Provost for Academic Technologies and Information Services, and he's going to uh, introduce uh, Alex Cartwright for us. Good morning, Alex. Morning, everyone. Um, it, as Alex said, I'm Kerry Hatch. I'm an associate provost for Academic and Information Technology and Information Services at the SUNY System Office, and it's um, my pleasure to introduce Provost Alexander Cartwright to you today. Um, I'm not going to read the bio that's on the website. It does talk about all the patents and research and areas that the provost is interested in, but I do also want to make you aware of a little bit more about the provost as a person. Um, if you don't know, Alex um, grew up in the Bahamas, um, went, left the Bahamas, went to Iowa, and was actually a student at a community college in Iowa. And eventually, I think we believe he started there in, um, in accounting, um, found out he didn't particularly care for it, and decided to become an engineer. Um, the thing that I find really interesting about his bio, and it's not, what's on, it's not something that's on the web page, and I really think it should be, He's a 2002 recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Teaching Excellence. He is passionate about <laughs> um, he's passionate about teaching and learning. He's passion, passionate about, about students. He's passionate about access. And he's passionate about diversity and inclusiveness. Um, so it's really my pleasure to open up the floor to uh, Provost Alexander Cartwright. Alex? Um, thank you. Um, right now, all I can see is the podium. <laughs> and there's no one at the podium. <laughs> Anthony's going to pick. Is there a different view <laughs> that I could have or not? Otherwise, I feel like I'm just talking to the back of a computer. Who's in what? Because I'm not even sure, is the, is the podium actually in the room with you? <laughs> I swear, all I see is the very top of the podium and the Sony banner behind it. That's... Oh. That's what he is seeing, the podium. Let's dial back in. Yeah. Is he there? <laughs> if you can hear me, we're working on it. Hello. Welcome to the conferencing system. Did you Oh, that's much better. I can see people now. <laughs> it's a little bizarre. Uh, thank you, uh, and, and good morning. Uh, I'm really, you know, I, I, I see you have a pretty good turnout there. I know you're 
you have a full room. I assume the other side of the room looks similar. Um, I, I, by the way, you can tell that I'm not a, I, I, I'd much rather be in person um, than be over video. Uh, the, uh, I, I want to first commend um, Alexandra Pickett uh, for really putting together a strong agenda. And, I, and, and as I said, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, part of the reason that I'm not able to be there is that I'm actually going to be leading a few conversations here in Buffalo, and, sorry, in Buffalo, in, uh, you can tell I've been, I've been in Buffalo too long, in Albany, uh, related to some of the uh, uh, similar topics to you. We have our uh, micro-credentialing task force tomorrow, uh, which is meeting all day uh, to talk about what, what, what would we do with micro-credentials and what could actually, um, what, what may we do as a system. Um, I know you're hearing tomorrow some of the terrific resources that Lumina Foundation um, put together in credentialing, and, and that work certainly would inform what we're doing uh, on the broader task force. Um, I, if you look also at the other topic that I know is on your agenda, it's the Open SUNY 2.0, um, a topic I know you're going to be discussing and that I really do want you to uh, spend a, a little bit of time on uh, thinking about you know what is our uh, overall commitment to completion and how we're going to actually use our online uh, resources and, and maybe uh, help with many of the things that we need to do in completion. Um, I assume many of you have heard the 150,000 completions. How many have heard about this number? And those of you who didn't, I assume you were out of the country for a long time. Uh, so, um, or maybe like I was when I was doing, when I was mostly a faculty member, and that is in my lab and not paying attention to anything else that was going on. Uh, I, you know, a good part of that work we've been doing over the past six months is really thinking about how we get to 150,000, um, looking at our historical enrollment Mac, uh, trends, looking at degrees. Uh, granted, um, where are those degrees granted? How you know what areas? What's the physical infrastructure and physical capacity that we have on our campuses? Um, what's the total enrollment by degree type? What's the total degrees granted by degree type? Um, what are the degrees awarded uh, by level? Right for SUNY and CUNY and the privates, can we uh, learn something from what our our uh, you know, counterparts are doing, um, the privates and others, uh, and, and, you know, Carrie and others can talk about the implications of some of that studies. Um, I won't have time to do that, uh, but suffice it to say that we could probably learn some things from uh, the privates and from CUNY in terms of what they're doing. One thing I'll tell you right away and why we became so interested in the micro-credentialing is that uh, if you look at our privates in the state, they have many, many more certificate programs and award many more certificates than we do uh, at both the undergraduate and at the graduate level. Um, and I know that that's driven some of our campuses to start thinking, our comprehensives, for example, to start thinking about what types of certificates could they be offering at the graduate level, uh, continuing education, the professional development that we need to be giving our, our, our professionals uh, in, uh, throughout, the, throughout the state. Um, all of that we need to take in, in, into account. We think about the rate of uh, grant, um, degrees that we're awarding uh, on enrollment, and we think about our current online uh, activity and the growth in online activity over time. Um, I think that's really an important uh, topic, and that is how do we really grow that? Um, what could we do that helps uh, our students, but also that helps our faculty? And I'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, it, you know, one of the uh, interesting components is, of course, how students move through our system uh, over time, the transfers, the new students coming in. Um, we thought about students completing with a degree or a certificate, and we certainly also thought about our students that are leaving and why are they leaving and the attrition um, that is involved with that. Uh, uh, we, we had, uh, uh, um, there are many reasons that uh, people leave, many reasons that they don't complete, and I'll talk a little bit about those as I go through, you know, what we're considering to be four strategies, um, and you'll see why I did this at the end, because 
a big component of it is certainly online. Um, uh, one of the things we want to do is, of course, increase retention and graduation rates of existing students, which is essentially decreasing our, our uh, attrition. And here what we're really trying to do is move each campus towards what we're calling best in sector. So we're not comparing community colleges' uh, retention and graduation rates to, uh, say, uh, tech sector or comprehensives. We're saying within that sector, what is the best that we've seen in any of our campuses and can all the others actually achieve that? Um, uh, there was a, we, we had a presentation yesterday, um, and I had one earlier uh, in the week uh, by EAB. Yesterday we had one by Starfish. And some of the things that were interesting in there, the comment yesterday that struck me, um, and I don't know if, if, if Kerry uh, and others who were in that field felt the same way, but the one that was really telling was that we have so many interventions that are focused on getting students into college, getting them ready for college, getting them through the first year. And then we somehow just think that magically they're going to complete. Um, we don't have the, the additional um, emphasis on completion. And what are those interventions that help people to complete? And they're simple things, like one of the ones that they showed that they knew was really a successful strategy was to have them complete a degree or certificate along the way. Um, you know, people who complete their associate's degree are much more likely to complete their bachelor's degree. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting that, that this is the type of things that are coming out of data analysis. And we need to be thinking more about how we do that. Um, and that leads me into the increased credentialing um, strategy. How do we think about stackable credentials, badges? Um, how do we uh, certainly give the skill sets to our students that they might need uh, in a way that, that they can uh, more easily access uh, rather than thinking about the traditional classroom. Um, so I'm very interested in how we might be able to do some of that increased credentialing. And what are, what are those credentials? And I, I want them to be quality uh, credentials, things that are useful, things that we can be proud of, things that show the quality of the SUNY system. Um, I don't want us to be going down that path that I know some people worry about, I certainly worry about, in that they say we're a degree mill, um, where that's not what we're after. We're after quality, and we're after doing what's right for our students. Um, I, you know, a big part of the, hitting the 150, though, is even if you do all of those things, you still need to increase enrollment. Um, and there's many reasons we want to increase enrollment. Uh, uh, if you look at some of our system, throughout the system right now, you look at news stories, you will see that we do have some campuses that have the capacity that, you know, they are admitting that they are under-enrolled and they're having to make some uh, cuts. They're going to have to do some things to really um, be able to ensure that they can uh, pay for everything that they're paying for uh, or maybe have to cut some of the costs. So uh, can we increase enrollment on those campuses? Can we get them up to what we call historical maximum so that they're thriving communities and helping in the community. Um, that is one that I think has to be a, a focus. And we need to think about post-traditional learners, because the number of students coming out of high school isn't going to increase drastically. And in fact, it's going to stay relatively flat and then start to decrease. Um, but we have almost 7 million people uh, throughout the state of New York who have no uh, education beyond high school. And can we, you know, can we help them? The, the numbers are there that if you get a bachelor, uh, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, your lifetime earnings are drastically higher. The quality of life is drastically higher. Your health is better. Um, all of these are things that we need to keep in mind that help the state. So there's many reasons we want to educate people um, and get them uh, a better education. Um, and the last part is the part that's clearly uh, geared towards you and what you're doing, and that is how do we uh, grow online? What do we do online? Uh, and we are targeting 80,000 uh, uh, enrollments online, an additional 80,000. And that's a big increase. And really, that's where the challenge of building what we're calling Open SUNY 2.0 comes in. Um, I, I have to tell you that you know I know we are positioned well in terms of technology. We have a great infrastructure online. We have many things that we can do online. But what I'm looking at is, how can we innovate? What can we do differently that, you know, 
and in all things that we do, uh, and especially in, a, in an area like online, uh, we're competing uh, with others. And we need to innovate to be competitive. Uh, and how do we deliver it? Uh, how do we deliver that educational content most effectively to our students? And what does that mean? What is Open SUNY 2.0 is what I keep asking. Um, and really, uh, where can that go? And that's what I want you to really think about. And I'm looking for ideas. I'm looking for innovative ideas and nothing, you know, uh, innovation um, truly is uh, stepping out of that box, right? And doing something that other people haven't thought about. So don't, don't, don't try to stay too close to what you're used to. Think about what could be different. What could we do that really would set us aside and deliver education in the way that we should be delivering it to all of our students. Um, you know, one of the things I think we should also think about is right now we have a lot of duplication out there in courses, lots of across all of our campuses. Can we do something differently there? Can we think about uh, offering courses um, collaboratively across multiple campuses. Um, is that possible? Uh, I think you know we need to, to really uh, think about that um, because I think there's some efficiencies that can be gained and that efficiency then allows us to do some of the other things we need to be doing and that is maybe putting more courses online, other degree programs, uh, innovative ways to have uh, deliver content um, you know essentially asynchronously so that I'm delivering my uh, course material, but then my labs may be um, you know, over some two week period in the summer. Um, there are many things that we could be thinking about uh, that I'd like for you, you, you know this area much better than I do, um, to, to think about how do we overcome the barriers of individual campuses and the ownership of particular uh, uh, courses or programs and really start to build out into a much more collaborative environment. Historically, we've not been great at collaborating, right? Um, I, I, I mean, not just SUNY, in general, the academy. Um, because we've always had single author books, right? The textbook for some particular course is a single author. Um, a course is a single professor. Uh, that is our tradition. Um, can we do something differently? Um, can we start thinking about pieces of pulling out material that make um, make for a much better experience. The other data that we saw yesterday from Starfish was uh, that they uh, presented, um, uh, and I think it was it, it was done by a comparative uh, comparison of multiple uh, universities, all offering, say, an orientation class, and then what they were able to pull out is which of those orientation classes were most effective, and then even further, what are the components that are common to those very effective ones. And then you could start pulling out within a course, what are the key modules that students really find beneficial. Um, I think we need to be thinking about that. What are those key uh, things that people uh, need to know that helps them uh, to move forward? That's what I'm talking about with Open uh, SUNY 2.0. Can we do that? Um, and I mentioned this already, but I want us to be uh, world leaders in this area. I want us to be certainly the leader in the state. Uh, I want us to be the leader in the country and in the world. And SUNY can do that collectively. Um, but right now, you know, if you talk to people in the public, uh, we're inundated with ads from Arizona State, and I, I intentionally forget the name of the other one, Southern New Hampshire, uh, uh, just because I'm tired of hearing about them. Uh, I mean, Southern New Hampshire is not SUNY. Uh, it's not even close. Um, and the fact that they are our competitor is actually a little bit embarrassing to me, um, or at least seen as a competitor, because I don't think they are, by the way. I, I think we deliver a much better quality product in general, and we can do uh, much better online. Um, so I think we need to think about all of those things. What are the collaborations to increase efficiencies? What's the new marketing efforts that are needed to make this uh, work? And really, how do we work on our overall offerings? Um, and I'll be happy to answer any uh, questions. Um, I, I want, uh, I know Carrie, Kim, and Alex are going to uh, be there. They can certainly uh, get a lot of your ideas, um, but you can also send uh, ideas uh, to me. Um, as I tell everybody, I, I might read them. Um, I don't guarantee a response. Um, 
just because I, I sometimes just don't have time to respond to, to some of those things. But you know, if you send some comments that you want to get directly to me, you can just send it to provost.suny.edu. Um, I'd be happy to uh, hear from you and see what you're thinking. Um, and I, I want you, as you move around today, to really think about what's the opportunities for collaboration, and especially what's the opportunities for collaboration in education. I think there are some unique things we could be doing, and I applaud you for being really the thought leaders in this area, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you and getting your input on how we move forward with everything online. So thank you. I'd, I'd answer any questions if you have them. Thank you very much, Provost Cartwright. Does anyone have any questions? I'm sure that you do. I know it's early. Brandon, um, there is a mic. Please use the microphones, correct. Can you make sure that it's on? Thank you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. OK. So last week, <clears throat> I'm from SUNY ESF, and we just wrapped up a, a National Science Foundation grant with, six, with five other SUNYs and SUNY Central Admin, where we were trying to have graduate students go into after school programs. And part of the scale up effort was to have them take an online course through ESC. And the, the biggest, one of the big obstacles is how can we have students taking a course at ESC that they're not paying tuition for and maintaining their full time status. So I think what you mentioned about the, you know, the, the some sort of tuition sharing like what are the plans for working on some sort of tuition sharing where a student can take a course at another campus without having to jump through hoops or yeah. do a study abroad or something yes we we've actually been talking a lot about this and what would that model be and it's really complicated um, so one of the things we're doing is going through I didn't mention this, but we have a whole implementation strategy for the completion agenda. And as part of that, because of the online, because we want to be able to have people taking classes from different campuses, we have to think about what's the resources that each campus gets from that process, right? And that, I think, that process, the implementation strategy for completion, we're hoping that will drive us reaching a model for how we share those resources. I can't guarantee that because you know how complicated it is to whenever you, we're all happy until we start talking about money and then we become enemies. Um, it's, so it's, it's a little, it's a tough topic. Um, but I think there are models. Carrie has talked about uh, models for some of the cross registration, uh, sharing of money, some, you know, some dollars coming back to the system to maintain some things, some things going to each campus. I think there are models that if we, if we really want to do it across the system, and it's really going to take that we need the support of our faculty in that this is an important topic. Because one of the things that will happen is if we don't have the support and saying this is really what we want to be doing, we, the faculty, want to be doing this and we think this is the best thing for our students, it becomes really hard for us at system to drive things. Because we need support from the constituents saying, this is a key component to what we're doing moving forward and how we help uh, all of our students. But yes, we are thinking about it. We don't have an answer right now. Any other questions for Provost Cartwright? Peter. Uh, Provost Cartwright, this is uh, Peter Shea from the University of Albany. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I think some of the significant challenges that the campuses confront in terms of uh, acting more collaboratively or in different ways is that we're held accountable to metrics by uh, organizations like U.S. News and World Report that don't recognize that kind of collaboration. So the University of Illinois School of Education just had its online education programs ranked in the top 5% nationally, and we're very proud of that. And we think it'll be beneficial for us as a campus and beneficial for the SUNY system and attract additional enrollments, attract additional attention. But those kind of traditional metrics don't reflect what we're talking about here today. Uh, collaborative uh, programs, they are, we're ranked in traditional ways. And 
I'd like to hear your comment upon some of the challenges we confront in terms of acting more collaboratively when uh, the, the ranking organizations that provide so much um, energy just don't recognize that. Yes, uh, very, very good point. Um, I think one of the things we have to figure out how to do is if we're going to share courses across multiple campuses, can they uh, uh, count multiple times in each in each program, right? Uh, I, I think we have to be more creative in how we allow uh, people to count uh, what they're doing. Um, if our students are taking courses at another campus, shouldn't, should, and, and we acknowledge that that is a part of our program, we're one system, so why can't that actually be considered as part of what we're doing? Um, that doesn't answer your total question because what, what you're asking is a really complicated uh, question about rankings. Um, we had an interesting conversation. I had an interesting conversation yesterday with a number of presidents, and I won't say which president said this, but uh, uh, there's a there's a world ranking. Um, uh, I forgot who does it, but there's a world ranking of universities. And really, if you look at the metrics there, almost everything goes back to the scale, the size, the number of people you have. Okay. And what was suggested is why isn't SUNY ranked as a single university? Because then rather than having none of our institutions in the top 100, we could be in the top 20. Uh, SUNY could be in the top 20. Um, I think it's very interesting. It turns out that after a little more checking, um, this is what UMass did. UMass submitted to this ranking as a single university. Uh, not as multiple campuses, and they added all of their research expenditures, everything all together, and now they have a, a higher ranking than they would individually. Um, and then everybody takes credit for that ranking, uh, that we're part of this top 20 institution. Um, I think we have to start thinking about what does that, what does that mean? Um, can we have virtual... Uh, I, I've thought about this quite a bit, and I don't know if we could ever get there, but... You know, I'm from engineering, and our engineering programs um, are, are, for the most part, undersized. When we compete with the top, you know, 50, top uh, 20 uh, engineering programs, it really boils down to the number of faculty you have. And so our engineering, you know, in my area, for example, most of our, uh, our departments would be around 30-something in, in the SUNY system. Uh, but the top programs are 120 up to 150, right? Uh, why couldn't we have virtual, uh, say, electrical engineering uh, departments that are, uh, in fact, 60 or more, uh, and that they count uh, across the institutions? Um, I don't think anybody's ready for that right now, but I think we should, we should start putting the pressure on and start presenting ourselves in such a way that we could show that we are a top-ranked institution. Because I can tell you, if you look at our numbers across the whole system, and if you take those top faculty, if you take the innovators, if you look at the NSF funding in education and the innovative activities of all the people across SUNY, we are one of the best institutions in the world. Um, but because of how we're split up, we get ranked uh, lower. Um, so I, I think your point is well taken, and I think maybe we need to have a, a group really thinking about how could we you know, I don't want to say it this way, but sort of game that system, right? Lots of other people have figured out how to game it, um, and maybe we need to be looking more closely at what could we do to present uh, SUNY in the best way possible. Um, and that might mean that, you know, it, we, we have to figure out also a way that that credit goes back to the individual campus based on that uh, ranking. So, but good question, and I don't have an answer to that one either. So, so far, I didn't have an answer to either one of the questions. <laughs> But they're good questions. <laughs> yes, Paul. Paul, I have a question in terms of collaboration, and I'm work, I work at a community college, and the bean counters seem to be very important in terms of, you know, how we get reimbursed and who gets credit for the enrollment. But then another part of the equation is residency requirements. This collaborative stuff would be great except the bean counters at all the colleges are going to be fighting over, you know, who gets credit for it, how do we get reimbursed, but really more importantly for, 
for me is the residency. We only allow so many transfer courses. If we start working collaboratively and people are taking it here, people are taking it there, the residency requirement alone will kill the concept unless we have a way to deal with that. Uh, again, uh, a great topic. One that I don't have an answer for. Uh, I just wanted but to a great point topic. Out. No, no, it, but, but you know what we need to do? And what would be great is for us to document what are all of those barriers, right? What are the things that are stopping us from collaborating? And then let's figure out how do we put the right group of people together to start thinking about how do we address them, right? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean and where do we need to address it? That would be very, very useful, especially moving forward with the completion implementation that we're trying to do. We want to have those discussions with the campuses. Um, I can tell you that it's even worse than campus to campus, okay? Because I know that there are institutions where they limit the number of credits someone can take outside of a particular college within an institution, mm -hmm. right? So we say, okay, you're an electrical engineer, you know, you, you can't take any more than two classes outside of electrical engineering. And to me, it's like, um, you know, that might have worked 30, 40 years ago, um, but it doesn't work anymore. The people working in any of these areas need to be taking classes outside of their discipline. Nowadays, it is as much about what you know in other areas uh, than it is about what you know in your own base area. Uh, you know, there are reasons that... Um, I, I, went to, I went to Cuba last week, or whenever it was, last week, um, and one of the things that struck me was they have a school that is a design school, a university that is about design, okay? Now, what does that mean? Why did that strike me? Why did I find it so fascinating? Because in that school are engineers, you know, uh, marketing people, uh, fashion designers, um, and they're all in the same school. And so, and, you know, sociologists and psychologists and everybody, because if you're really going to be innovative in design, it's your, you need your base skill set, but you also need to be able to talk to all of these other people doing uh, different things. Um, so I think that's a really big topic that you hit on is how do we do collaboration in general, right? Uh, I think it's really acute for online, because for online, um, we do say, in principle, we say lots of things where you could take classes anywhere, right? But that isn't quite true, right? There's some limits to how many you can take outside, and it is because of the way we count the credit and because of then uh, who can, you know, how many classes can you take away from your um, campus. I mentioned to some faculty about uh, at the UFS, you know, that, you know, could we get to a situation where a, uh, a, a student takes a class, you know, from um, multiple universities, right? So if they need 30 classes to complete, they take it from 30 different institutions across SUNY and can they get a degree? Um, it's a question. I, 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 you know, if you think about it from designing your own curriculum, uh, if, it, if it, I mean, I know there's accreditation issues and all of that stuff, but putting all of that aside, you know, if they really wanted a customized degree, um, wh why couldn't something like that work? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I know there's lots of other complications with it, but I think it's, you're, you're right on about how do we handle that and, and how do we deal with the enrollment issues and how do we deal with credit. Uh, and especially for the faculty, because also if you start collaborating and you're teaching, you're co-teaching, right? Say there's, I don't know, 10 people teaching one class, each one with a module, right? then how does that work, right? And you have 10 different faculty across 10 institutions. How does that work? Who gets credit? How, do they, how does that count towards your load? Uh, I'd love for us to start tackling all of that. I don't think we can solve it in a year, by the way. I think it'll be multi, multi that's a multi-year problem. I have uh, one more question on two issues. Um, one is the state authorization reciprocity agreement and the status of SUNY uh, New York's participation in SARA. And the other is on international and out-of-state online student tuition differential between 
the current rate and the, proje the projected rate. Is there a stat? Is there yeah. an update on those? I, I, I think I heard your question. Um, I didn't quite get all of it, but I, I think it was about Sarah uh, and what's the current status of it. And the, and the, one. And and I, the other part is uh, the, tui the different tuition for international out of state online students. Uh, my oh, understanding. Differential tuition. Um, I'm hoping that Carrie can help me with the current status of Sarah and the differential tuition. Uh, yeah. I know that we do have, we are trying to move forward on with Sarah. I, I don't know um, what's the current stopping point, um, Carrie. Alex, I'm going to actually talk about that in my update. Um, oh. So uh, yeah, I'll cover that. Thanks. And Kim, do you also Great. have the tuition piece? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Alex? Yes, go ahead. Please say who you are at, and what campus you're from. I'm Madeline Crosito from the School of Business, SUNY L. Westbury, so I hope this is a practical question. Um, I'm hearing this concern about collaboration, and I have one as well, but I'm wondering if there's already a structure in place, perhaps, that we could collaborate with these certificate programs online, so we could cut across campuses, do SUNY-wide type of advertising, so to speak, and get the certificates online. Um, is there a structure in place to kind of implement that in, in a relatively efficient manner? Um, Kim, can you repeat what was said? Because I actually couldn't make out most of that. You have to talk right here. I can hear you yep. very well. Kim, I think there was a question about, um, you know, in the spirit of collaboration, are, is there, are there structures in place to enable that for certificates that it sounds like include both the promotion and um, uh, as well as how the program would actually be offered? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, that's one of the things, and, I, and in fact, um, uh, I'm going to write that down because it's one of the things I'm hoping that our micro-credential task force will think about. Because I agree with you that if we're going to be offering more either certificates, micro-credentials, or otherwise, we need to be thinking about how does that work across multiple campuses. Um, and in fact, especially in some of the certificates that we might be offering, we might be able to do that across multiple uh, campuses, and we need to think of how that would how that would really work. Um, is there, yeah, that's the best I can answer that one right now because our micro credentialing task force is meeting tomorrow for the first time. Okay. Yes. Good morning. I'm Beth Heavey from SUNY Rockford. Is it on? Is that on? Sorry. Good morning. I'm Beth Heavey. I'm one of the faculty and ambassadors from SUNY Brockport. I would like to go back to your completion agenda for a moment. Um, I've noticed that when we're looking at interventions, we have some really great ideas, and I'd like to see the progress we're making there. I'm wondering if we're looking at that from the perspective of the different diverse populations that we're serving at all. I teach in an RN to BSN completion program for non-traditional adult learners. Um, and some of the steps that we have been implementing on state and national levels to try to improve completion for traditional undergraduate students actually create barriers to completion for non-traditional adult students. So I'm just wondering if that's something that we're considering or talking about at all at a statewide level. Absolutely. Um, it's a perfect comment. I didn't talk about this, but one of the things that um, we have been spending time on is we recognize exactly what you just said, that not all interventions work for all populations, right? And some of the things that we need for non-traditional are different from what we would do with our students who are coming straight out of high school. Um, and I, I didn't think about the fact that some of them might actually not work well at all, and in fact, indeed. Uh, uh, so if you have data on that, that would be great to have. One of the things that we've been commenting on is, is, is exactly what you just said that we have all of these strategies, you know, we have like 22 or something that are all these completion strategies and things you can do that are best practices on your campuses. And if you look at those, I would argue that what, we, what it shows is our bias towards the traditional student, okay? And so what we've talked about is now we need an equivalent set that is for non-traditional. Right? So if you, if you, if this group can help us with what are those interventions that work for non-traditional, I think that would be really, really useful for us. Uh, that would be great if you could give that to me. Um, you know, we, we know, for example, 
um, that interventions work differently across even different demographics, right? Like if you look at applied learning, um, the, the numbers show very clearly that the benefit uh, to, to people from lower socioeconomic uh, status or otherwise, or, or, or even uh, um, uh, you know, underrepresented groups is much more beneficial than for our, our traditional uh, you know, middle class uh, white, for example. Um, so the, 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 what we could accomplish and who we use certain interventions for is really something we need to focus on. So I would love to have, if this group has great ideas there, what the right interventions are, what we should be doing, your experience from the uh, RN, uh, the nursing program, would be really beneficial to us because those, that's the type of student we think we need to be going after to achieve the 80,000. So it's a great point. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay. I, I, I'll, I'll say thank you. I'll, I'll stop here and say thank you for your time. Um, I always love it when I talk to people and they ask all the questions that they ask. I can't answer any of them. Um, <laughs> that means that I have a great group of thinkers because your questions are complex enough that they weren't easy for me to answer. So thank you so much, and really, I, I hope you think about all the questions you asked me and, and how we might be able to address some of those questions. So if you could spend time on that, um, it would benefit all of us at SUNY. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Provost Carter. Thank you. Okay, we're only a little behind schedule. <laughs> Um, I want to thank the provost again for joining us this morning. Um, I also want to thank Carrie uh, Hatch and Kim Scalzo and the Open SUNY Coates staff that uh, is here. Um, in case by chance you don't know who I am, um, I am Alexandra Pickett um, and I uh, um, lead the Open SUNY Center for Online Teaching Excellence, and I am welcoming you again to the second annual Open SUNY Coat Summit here uh, at the Global Center. Um, I want to also thank the Global Center for their hospitality um, and, you know, everybody who uh, played a role in, in um, us having this event here. It's a, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into um, uh, doing the conference, and so uh, we couldn't do it without Nancy uh, Motondo and Michaela Rem from the CPD and others at the CPD. Um, and I also want to direct your attention to the man, the men behind the counter, behind the um, the curtains there, Jeff and Antonio, Anthony. Um, uh, we're streaming live, and um, you know the video conference and everything. And so I, I'm very appreciative of uh, of them and of their efforts to make sure that the technology works. Uh, for us. We're very happy to be here at the Global Center. I also want to point your attention to Laura Murray, who is our um, amazing photographer. Um, <laughs> and you may have seen some of her pictures um, in the slideshow this morning. Um, she will be taking pictures throughout the event. There are some fabulous pictures of individual people over the years at these events. And I'm looking at, um, <laughs> at people who I know have pictures that are there. If you haven't seen um, the pictures, if you go to Flickr and do a search on um, Coat Summit uh, or um, SLN or Open SUNY Coat Summit, you will find the group uh, that has all of our pictures <laughs> over the last 17 years. This is the 17th annual gathering of this group. Um, and that, um, it started in 1998 and we missed one year. We just didn't do it one year for some reason. I don't know. I don't remember why. Um, uh, so I also want to thank all of you, the participants and the presenters, um, for, uh, for making this summit what it is. Um, this particular summit, we've made an effort to reach out to um, other online practitioners uh, who have experience in, in um, you know, one facet or another of online teaching and learning, and in particular, online faculty and online librarians, or uh, librarians who support um, online teaching and learning. Um, and you'll be learning more about that today. We have a workshop this afternoon um, targeting um, interaction and collaboration between librarians and instructional designers. And tomorrow you'll be meeting our new uh, 2016 online uh, teaching ambassadors. Um, 
I also want to mention that for uh, this event, uh, the National University Technology Network Board uh, is with us. Um, they're having their annual board meeting right now upstairs, and they will be joining us for lunch. And tomorrow they will join us, and Friday they will join us here at the conference itself. Um, I So if you see people milling around that you may not recognize, and if they happen to be from you know, out of state, it's probably one of the board members. And you can go to newton.org and see who the board members are. I would like to encourage you um, to make a point of meeting them. Uh, the N in Newton stands for networking. And one of the uh, uh, membership in Newton is one of the benefits that we, the CPD and Open SUNY COPE, provide to the online um, community of, uh, uh, of practitioners. And so um, I'd like to help you to be familiar with them. And so that's why they, we have them here at the event um, uh, this year. And they come every other year when we're in New York. Uh, they come and join us for, uh, for the conference. Um, I'd also like to thank the virtual attendees. Hi. Um, for everybody that's out there um, listening in or watching the, the live streaming, we make this uh, whole conference available um, for free without registration. It's streamed live and recorded. Um, and the hashtag, um, um, if you're uh, live tweeting uh, the event, is um, hashtag Coat Summit. Um, and so if you have questions uh, in the virtual virtual audience or even here um, in the face-to-face um, -face audience, uh, for any of the presenters, you can um, use that hashtag in Twitter. And um, uh, we have a Twitter team that's um, captained by Aaron Maney, uh, who will be um, assisting in um, looking at the, the tweet Twitter stream and making sure that we're aware of any questions that come in from virtual participants. So I really want to um, welcome you also and thank you for, for joining us for um, uh, any part of the summit that you are able to view remotely. Um, I wanted to mention, um, if you're not yet an Open SUNY fellow, to please join. For those of you who are not SUNY, from SUNY, you can join as a friend of SUNY. Um, it's really, you know, me and Aaron and, and uh, a couple of other of our staff that are behind there. So we're not going to pester you or bother you, but it's the only way that we have to make sure that you were aware of some of the events and the things that we do, like this, um, like this event. And so I. I um, uh, encourage you to join if you haven't yet joined. Um, I also uh, wanted to show you some other links. I mentioned the Flickr photos. Um, and these, in case you're not familiar with some of the, um, uh, you know, some of the link resources that we uh, provide. Um, the Coat Hub is a new site that is resourceful uh, that you might be interested in uh, taking a look at. And so these slides will be available later. You don't have to worry about them right now. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure to mention them and to, um, uh, to highlight them. I w think this is not the right slide because I don't see it. Um, but um, the last thing I want to mention is um, badging. We are badging the conference. Um, there's a, everyone who attends will be eligible to uh, um, uh, collect their um, commemorative 2016 summit badge, which is um, um, you know nice. So you'll all be able to get one. Um, workshop uh, participants will get a workshop badge. The folks who are presenters will get a speaker badge. Um, and we are also using badging to promote social um, uh, interaction in, in um, different social media. And so uh, if you um, use the hashtag uh, Coat Summit and are interested in collecting any of those social media badges, you can go to our Credly site and read more about how you can earn those social media badges. Um, the different um, social medias are, would be things like Digo, Flickr, Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, um, LinkedIn, SlideShare, Ning, and just for Nate, Plurk. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, OK. Oh, the last thing I want to mention is the research that we're conducting kind of um, at the same time uh, as we're here. We decided to um, also um, uh, do some um, 
it was a good opportunity for us to collect some uh, data. We are doing a, a study on faculty attitudes toward online teaching. The online teaching ambassador program is associated with that. And Peter Shea and a panel of uh, new online teaching ambassadors will be um, having a panel presentation tomorrow afternoon. And, and then just so that you know, there is also a re research study being conducted right now as we speak. There are, there are researchers upstairs um, interviewing some of the online uh, teaching ambassadors who, um, who happen to also be here. Um, Jeremy Case from Monroe Community College is our videographer and during the breaks and stuff you may see a guy with a camera walking around and he will be collecting um, uh, uh, respond, your responses to myths and misperceptions about online teaching that we then will be using in um, uh, professional development activities with new online faculty and prospective online faculty. So I encourage you to allow yourself to be videotaped and to give uh, Jeremy, um, you know, the benefit of your um, your wisdom and and your thoughts on some of the myths and misperceptions that you know of that um, that either you may have had before you started teaching, or that your colleagues may have had, or that you are aware of, um, uh, so that we can better understand from your perspective um, how to respond to those uh, myths and misperceptions. All right, did I hit everything? I think I did. So. Uh, without further ado, I uh, have the um, very distinct pleasure to formally introduce to you Kim Scalzo in her new role as the Executive Director of uh, uh, Open SUNY. Thank you, Alex. Um, not too much longer that it can be that we can say that it's new, right? I think I'm eight months in right now, so get my... It's, your first summit, though, as it's my first summit, and I'm very... <laughs> Very excited to be here um, and to be able to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing with Open SUNY and where we are. So, okay. Kim, can excuse that, right? me for interrupting. Can, can we yes. just get the password for the Wi-Fi? Password for the Wi-Fi is on the wall right there. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Very important question. Um, okay. Can I do this? Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm going to talk. Um, uh, how am I doing time-wise, Alex? Okay. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, tr we'll try to pick us up, save some time here, but um, I want to make sure that I um, talk to you a little bit more about Open SUNY 2.0. The provost talked a little bit about that. I'm going to try to make that a little more um, uh, concrete and specific for us so you know kind of what are the things that, that we're trying to accomplish there. I'm going to give an update on our digital DNA refresh. I know some of you have seen recent updates on that. Um, a little more info to share um, and just want to make sure that we're continuing to keep our community um, informed about how that's going and where we think we're heading and what that might mean for, for everyone. And then I'm going to provide some service updates because there's a lot that's been happening um, from the perspective of services we provide and a lot of things that we are um, discussing and are evolving as we go through this DNA refresh. And so it's always a good chance when we get together to give you some updates on that. Okay, so Open SUNY 2.0, um, you, um, if you watched the State of the University, um, you saw that the Chancellor talked about Open SUNY 2.0 um, and this concept of an optimized personal education network and really kind of giving some meaning to what um, open means as an, as an acronym. acronym. Um, so, so here's a little bit about what that means. Um, um, so the provost talked a lot about um, collaboration. Um, so some examples of that, faculty to faculty partnerships. He talked about leveraging the strengths we have across our faculty and coming together at the course level um, for um, creating modules and, and open education resources and really looking for faculty to identify where there are great opportunities for that um, and ways that we can support that. Campus to campus partnerships. I think we've, he touched on that a lot. But I think for us, part of what we're seeing is that we still have some gaps in the offering of programs in the high needs areas where as we've gone to campuses, um, and they look at the lift to offer a whole program on their own, there are some challenges to that. And so we're hoping that we can facilitate collaborations across campuses where maybe, um, if multiple campuses are each putting up a piece, we can get some new programs going to address those gaps that we have. Um, 
campus to employer partnerships. So we are, um, uh, you know, trying to put some more support um, structures in place at the system level to talk with prospective partners who, by the way, are coming to SUNY already um, and coming to your campuses to really understand what are the needs of their employers from an education perspective and from a comprehensive needs perspective and how can we pull in the resources of um, campuses, either individually or multiple campuses, to respond to those needs. Um, and so we're looking to do more of that. We are um, expanding the um, concept of Open SUNY Plus. I know that's been a question that's been out there for a while. Um, uh, but we are looking to continue um, to encourage campuses to nominate programs, degree or certificate level for that plus designation um, where you are meeting the signature elements that, that um, adhere to the Open SUNY Plus standard. Um, so more of that. And then opportunities, uh, support, tools, and platforms to crowdsource the development of open and um, uh, shared course content. So um, from a platform perspective, um, that's something that we feel like even when we try to collaborate or try to um, get the collective input of our community, um, you know, there's lots of ways that we try to do that, but how can we do that more effectively and really have some true crowdsourcing opportunities? So that's a little bit um, about Open SUNY 2.0. This optimized personal education network is really just recognizing that learners are coming to us um, with a range of educational needs based on where they are. I was working um, on a group that's putting together kind of um, a uh, state of the system of where are we with non-credit on um, professional activity and we're acknowledging that some learners are coming to us with some college um, coursework. Um, some are coming already with, with college degrees. They're not necessarily looking for another degree. They're coming with maybe um, interest in particular skills or competencies and some want full degrees or programs. So we have to recognize that they're coming to us with a range of educational goals and objectives in mind and how can we provide entree to them to everything that's available in the system and provide more options for those um, uh, students who want something other than a full degree or certificate program. Um, more emphasis on new strategies. Um, this is what the provost talked about being innovative. Um, you know, so again, we have pockets of um, places across our system where campuses are doing prior learning assessment, adaptive learning platforms, competency-based education, and much more emphasis on this concept of stackable micro-credentials. And I won't say more about that because I feel like the provost um, talked about that a lot, but happy to talk offline with anybody. And then, of course, we were um, having conversation about this um, last night at dinner, um, you know, looking beyond online to, to blended learning opportunities and leveraging the physical facilities of our campuses for those students who are in proximity and have access to that. There's much more that you all, I know, um, uh, are talking about doing in that regard, and we want to support that as well. So um, that's a um, uh, little bit, um, hopefully gives you a little more understanding of what we're looking for. The one thing I want to say about this is this is not something the Open SUNY organization can make happen. Much of this has to be campus-driven and faculty-driven. And so we want to do what we can to support you in that. And I really um, want to um, applaud the questions about um, the in, while there's interest in collaborating, there are things working against us. I think those are the things that we can try to work on and tackle um, from the system perspective and, in fact, um, already um, have some activities in place to, to start working on that in many cases. All right, digital DNA refresh. Um, I know you've all seen this before. This is the um, digital DNA that was um, uh, uh, shared when Open SUNY was launched a couple of years ago. Um, and if you look at where we are today with Open SUNY, um, many things are in place. Those are the blue and the peach or orange and the gray circles. But in uh, yellow are the things that are still somewhere in process. And in process could be we're just, you know, barely starting that to it's almost in place and everywhere in between. We actually have some activities where there's been very, very little um, um, progress to date, if any. And those are the ones that have the black line around them. So, you know, when we look at where we are a couple of years in, still a lot of work to do. These were our objectives, um, to have an updated foundational um, uh, framework for Open SUNY, but is in the context of the completion agenda. Um, the completion agenda, um, you know, did not exist when we launched Open SUNY, so we have to do this. We, we are trying to frame everything we're doing now um, against that. Um, we're also looking for um, a strategy and shaping the direction of our work for the next three years. So um, this framework is going to help us 
um, align our priorities and budget requests as we go um, forward for the next three years in, in support of specific initiatives for the completion agenda. Um, clarifying ownership and who is responsible for each of the initiatives that remain in our framework um, is going to be another outcome. And um, when you look at those things that are still in process or have very little activity to date, um, it's mostly because it wasn't clear who owned them. So that's a lesson that we've learned. We have to be very clear about that. And, um, and another big piece is um, building common understanding across um, uh, all of our stakeholders, whether it be at sysadmin or um, with you out on the campuses. So that's what a lot of the engagements that we've been doing to date have been about. This is the um, SUNY Excel's performance framework that all of the campuses are being asked to respond to. Um, uh, all of your campuses submitted performance improvement programs showing how you are um, addressing the um, goals in each of each piece of the framework. Um, and we're doing the same thing uh, with Open SUNY. And the com I want to also provide a clarification. Most people think the completion agenda is completion in access, completion, and success. The completion agenda is access completion and success altogether. So a lot of people say Open SUNY isn't just about completion, it's also about access and it's also about success. Well, yes and yes. So um, it's the completion agenda as a whole. As we have done this DNA uh, refresh, some guiding principles have emerged that are really kind of in our background and um, continuing to drive our thinking about this. And so we have four guiding principles um, that I'll talk about. And and as a corollary, um, how is that impacting the work that we're doing in this refresh, which is kind of like a strategic planning process. So the first is keeping our impact on the mission of SUNY front and center. And the mission of SUNY is... Um, that um, Excel's framework with us emphasizing on the completion agenda. So we are really trying to get much better at quantifying and um, being accountable um, for the work that we do to the metrics and the completion agenda. That means we're going to prioritize those things that are having impact and stepping back from those things that are not. Um, we are going to fully embrace our strategic leadership role. So we've recognized that that the role that we play with online learning in the system ranges from there are some things that we're really trying to provide leadership for and help campuses make progress on. And um, if you think of the institutional readiness, that's a good example of that, trying to engage your campus leaders, increase their awareness of online learning. And then there are some things that are really supporting your online learning operations, like the help desk. So we are going to try and focus um, uh, it doesn't mean we're gonna, we're gonna not do any of those things, but we're gonna try to focus on where we can really play a leadership role, um, and look to uh, the things that we're doing that are operational. How are those being supported? And how can that be done, um, in such a way that it works for the campuses and for us at system? Um, leveraging the power of partnerships, to me, um, you've heard me say this before, but this is one of the greatest um, outcomes, I think, of Open SUNY Plus to date, is the, the value that we've gotten, gotten out of partnering with all of you, our campuses, and the partnerships that you've had with each other on the, what I'll call the service and support side. Um, I think there's much more that we can do there as we think now to programmatic partnerships, <laughs> so we're going to continue to do that, and looking to... Uh, make sure your voice is continuing to shape our thinking and build in a role for the campus voice. And then taking collective ownership of Open SUNY, this initially started out as a guiding principle for our team, to for us to think broadly about our roles on the Open SUNY team. But really, this applies to us as a system. And um, we have to move away from the concept that Open SUNY is something that we, you know, that I as the Open SUNY Executive Director and our staff are responsible for. It's something that we as a system are responsible for. And we cannot be successful without collective ownership over that success. So so all of you here in this room, as well as um, your campus um, leadership, faculty, staff, have to all feel like this is important and think about the role that you play in it and how we can be successful. So, um, so that collective ownership piece is critical. And then another thing that has emerged is that we've recognized we play different roles with initiatives. When you look at all the um, circles on that digital DNA chart, um, uh, some of them we are leading. We have responsibility for directly on the Open SUNY team. We have the resources, we have the staff, and we are providing those services. In other areas, 
we have um, a very big vested interest, but we're partnering with somebody else, like um, Paul Marlers, who is here from Enrollment. Um, all those things around enrollment recruitment um, uh, are really a partnership between Open SUNY and the enrollment team. And so we have to work together to decide what we're going to accomplish and how that work is going to get done. And we have to be on the same page about the priority of those initiatives and the resources needed to accomplish those initiatives. So we're, we're working very closely with many different entities on, um, in partnership. And then there are other initiatives that we're playing more of a supporting role. These are things that are not necessarily open SUNY initiatives, but they affect our ability to be successful or we have an, um, vested interest in them. So things like, um, you know, cross campus credits and financial aid. That is, that is actually not an online issue. Um, that happens all the time, um, face to face. But I think with the visibility of Open SUNY, um, the challenges for students within the academic year who are trying to take courses um, on a campus other than their home campus have become more visible. So we are um, participating in those conversations, helping to inform the overall strategy there. But we are not we are not leading that initiative by any means. So those three roles, I think, are helping us to um, understand how our resources have to be allocated, where we have to partner with others and work um, in conjunction with them to align priorities and resources, and where we need to be engaged to support, which to me um, has been a really helpful framework, and I think for the Open SUNY team as well. When we look at that, and you go back to the DNA, the items in green are the things that we truly are leading. So, you know, this visual shows you how much is, um, requires <laughs> collaboration and partnership. Um, not just between us and others, but across campuses. All those initiatives in the upper right hand corner, which are academic initiatives, are really owned by campuses. You know, you are providing the programs, you are providing um, the content and the curriculum of what we're delivering online. So, um, so the, this to me, um, uh, you know, brings home the issue that, that we all have to own this or we are not going to be successful. So this is my plea to, um, you know, um, help you all, um, I think, understand that and say you're with us on this. Um, so as we think about our new framework, I said one of the outcomes was going to be an updated framework. Um, uh, we've actually thought a lot about the digital DNA and how much explanation it requires <laughs> um, uh, as we talk to people about Open SUNY. And so we are kind of taking a step back and going to a more traditional um, strategic planning type framework, which, by the way, is used in many organizations and works pretty well. Um, and so it starts with our vision, um, um, which I think everybody knows. Um, we've talked a lot about that. Um, has a few themes um, that really um, hopefully will resonate with our stakeholders and provide structure for um, the next layer, which are goals and metrics, which um, will try to, try to provide some greater focus. And again, that's the level where we'll be setting metrics for success. And then initiatives. And these initiatives equate to what were the circles um, on the bubble chart. So um, we're still going to have initiatives so you'll know what we're doing, but it's in um, a more um, structured framework, so to speak, um, and I'm not even um, necessarily sure we're going to call it DNA. So when we describe this to people that we've shared it with so far, it makes, they get it right away. Um, and so that is a big plus for us. Um, these are the four themes that have emerged as we've talked with campuses, um, with many of the role-alike groups, um, with the folks at system administration, um, where we need to focus our efforts for the next three years and where we need to place priority. The first one is to facilitate strategic growth. And I want to emphasize the words facilitate and strategic. So strategic is not just growth for the sake of growth, but, but there's actually been a lot of work done to understand where, um, uh, there are um, gaps in the programs that we're offering where we could be drawing new students um, and where campuses are um, uh, looking to and need to be increasing their enrollment. So we're going to focus there. Um, and facilitate is that our role is to facilitate that. You know, we are not um, delivering programs. We can't tell campuses or decide who should be growing at what scale, but we want to support and facilitate that in the ways that we can do that. Um, we're going to cultivate best practices, which we, which, you know, I think has been a hallmark of this organization. Um, uh, we're going to continue to do that, and we're going to try to do that across all the functions and all the roles that we support on the campuses. 
Same thing with build capability. We've always had a big professional development focus within um, SLN, now Open SUNY. That will continue, but we're going to be looking beyond what we have historically done in terms of professional development to how we can support others like um, campus leaders, um, technology folks. Um, we're already starting to work with librarians, so reaching beyond our traditional roles. And then promoting financial sustainability um, has a couple of components to it. It's for us. I think every time I go to a campus and talk about Open SUNY, people say to me, what's the business model? What's the business model? What's the business model? I think people want to know how is this financially sustainable? So we are looking at that from the Open SUNY operations perspective and what are the services that we're providing and how are they funded and making sure that what we're what we're doing can be sustained in the long run. Um, I think it also means helping campuses think about financial sustainability of online programs for themselves. And so some of you have heard us talk about this business case tool that we have and the enrollment planning roundtable support that we provide. That's another um, way that we're trying to help campuses um, look at it at that level as well. So, um, so that's going to be a big emphasis of what we work on in the next few years. So those are the four themes. And, um, and I should um, emphasize at this stage that this is the first time we're sharing these um, with our external community. These are um, uh, what we think makes sense, but we definitely want feedback on this. So if you feel like we've missed the boat, there's something dramatically missing, we want to hear that. Or if there's something we need to clarify, um, there's opportunity for that as well. So when you look at the themes, the next stage is goals. These are the goals that we, um, that we have outlined in each of those areas. And if you look at what we've talked about and how I describe each of the themes, you see that we're getting to another layer of specificity. I'm not going to talk through each one individually, but um, these we're going to share these slides. Um, and uh, um, and we again we want feedback on this, and we'd love to um, uh, um, you know engage. We're we're going to be bringing this to some of the stakeholder groups that we typically talk to um, for more dialogue, but wanted to share it here as well. So themes, these are the goals, and then the next stage is mapping those initiatives. So what initiatives are going to stay as part of Open SUNY versus not? And um, and at the initiative level, we're going to identify a few things. Um, is our role lead partner support? Um, who on our team is responsible for tracking that? Um, and is it a is that a campus support, a faculty support, or a student support? That's one of the things I actually liked about the digital DNA was that it was it it talked about um, students, faculty, and campuses as um, uh, as entities that we are serving, and I want to keep that. Um, that framework. I think we and the Open SUNY team feel like that has made sense. So we're going to tag each initiative with who it's supporting. And this will allow us to acknowledge where we have supports that might be um, serving multiple audiences, like our help desk serves both faculty and, and students, right? So, so more to come on this, but this is sharing kind of the framework and initial thinking about themes and goals. Next steps are um, we want to work to finalize the themes, goals, and initiatives within this new framework. Um, we are going to be developing project plans um, for um, our three-year time period for each of the initiatives. Um, we also, I didn't talk about this, but in the process of identifying these themes, goals, and initiatives, we've surfaced a series of strategic questions which we have to resolve. Some of them are new questions that have come about because of Open SUNY, so things um, like, um, you know, um, within COAT, who are, you know, who are the, the real um, uh, roles on the campuses that COAT serves? Um, it, initially, that was very clear. That got muddied a little bit. We want to really clarify that so we know who are who is um, coat supporting and what services are we providing to them. Um, we've also surfaced some other strategic questions in the research area, actually in all the areas, in the student supports area and in the um, in the campus supports area. So we've surfaced some questions. Some of them have been new. Some of them are questions that have actually been questions for a while, and we just are acknowledging that we have to resolve them um, to um, address those themes and the goals that we've outlined. Um, so, so we are working through those strategic questions. Some of them will need campus input, so we'll be coming to some particular groups um, to try and resolve those. And um, and continued stakeholder engagement throughout. I'm looking at Janet and others, and whenever anybody um, gives me the opportunity to come and talk about Open SUNY, I'm talking about this and sharing what we're doing and wanting um, folks to understand and be able to engage with us and help us um, along in this process. So um, continue to be on the lookout for that. All right, I'm going to try to go. Oops, I went the wrong way. 
little more quickly. Okay, um, a few service updates. Let me just tell you that um, one of the things that I'm really enjoying about um, this role that I'm in now is the ability to work with our Open SUNY team and the um, dedicated staff of professionals who work hard every day to try to provide the best services and support that we can to all of our, our um, campus constituents. So um, it's been really great and um, really enjoying that. So um, a few quick updates, and this is not representative of everything that's happening, just things I want to make sure we know about. We are going forward with Open SUNY Plus programs. I think many of you know the process to nominate new programs for the PLUS designation has been on hold for the past several months. We are um, working to reopen that nomination process, which will happen probably in mid to late March. So look for information about that. I know many of you have programs that you've been teeing up and waiting for that, so that'll be coming out. Um, a slight change in, good timing there coming in on that comment. <laughs> um, a, a slight change in the way we have been talking about this. We initially said there would be prerequisites to nominate your programs of having done the institutional readiness and the enrollment roundtables. Um, the change there is that that's not a prerequisite to nominate your program, but before you can get the designation, you have to have gone through those processes. So if your campus has already done that, you're fine. If not, um, if you've done one but not the other, you want to make sure you're getting in the queue on that. Um, we are, are bringing on a campus partnerships manager. Um, some of you may know that I was playing this role before I became the executive director of Open SUNY. Um, uh, that um, side of Open SUNY has been neglected for some time, so we're bringing on um, somebody who um, many of you know, Marty Dixon, to um, work with us initially on a consulting basis um, uh, to help us reframe that role and to work on the institutional readiness process on the Open SUNY Plus nomination and on onboarding new campuses who get the Plus designation. So she'll be joining us um, starting March 1st, and so you'll be hearing from her and seeing her and I couldn't be more thrilled about that. Sarah. Um, so, so two quick updates on that. Um, that has been included in the governor's budget for the coming year. Um, and so as long as it stays in the budget and gets passed, um, that is on track to be implemented um, and be available in the coming um, academic year, fiscal year, academic year, however you want to think about that. Um, we we um, shared um, a couple of months ago that campuses will have basically two fees for joining Sarah if your campus decides that you want to join. The first is um, a payment to Sarah, and the information about what that cost is is right on their website. We've sent that link out, but can resend it if folks are interested in it. The second fee is a fee to state ed for the support and the um, um, you know, operation that they have to support to enable all of this. And they have shared with us, um, they're still working on exactly what that fee is going to be, but they're looking at a range of 5000 to 9000 per campus. So that would be in addition to the fee from Sarah. Um, that um, information I just learned went out to the um, provost yesterday. We'll be forwarding that to the other list, so you'll have that as well. But that's where um, Sarah is. We're still on track to go forward um, and coming for the um, coming academic year. Um, hopefully that's good news to many of you. And then with the non-resident online tuition, so there has been a um, committee that has been put together um, at SysAdmin to um, look at what does this mean? We have to provide a recommendation to the Board of Trustees who has to actually act on this. Um, so we're looking at things like definitions. What does non-resident mean? Um, what, what, to what, um, to what does this apply? You know, does this apply to a student taking one online course? Does this apply to students who are taking some, um, you know, campus courses and some online courses? And we're really trying to target the um, uh, audience of students who I think were intended with this legislation, which are those out-of-state students who normally wouldn't be coming to our campuses um, but would be going to competitors. So we're really trying to make that definition um, clear that, th that that's the intended audience. Um, uh, the other thing we're looking at is what are other states doing? How are other states dealing with online students and online out-of-state students? So um, uh, Carrie has actually pulled together some information um, on that, and we can, sh you know, share with you what that's what what the data is that we're getting in. Um, and so I think that the group is going to be coming back together, um, you know, to talk about um, what our next steps are. But that is all going forward. And again, um, the idea is timing is for the upcoming um, up coming academic year. So progress um, being made. 
On the student support side, I think um, many of you know that there were two investment um, fund projects that were funded. Um, one um, that, that relate to Open SUNY, they weren't directly Open SUNY projects, but we're paying close attention to them and um, and they certainly affect what we're doing. One is um, uh, on the Star New York Consortium for Online Tutoring. Um, and I think, um, you know, we're still, um, you know, trying to understand um, exactly what that project is going to accomplish. It was scaled back from the funding they initially um, proposed. Um, we're not sure that's going to be the um, online solution for tutoring. We think it may be still one of um, of a couple that 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 are all the options available online. But that that project is um, going forward, and we're plugged in um, on the early alerts. I think um, it's in kind of a similar stage of um, you know that um, uh, we had the conversation yesterday with um, Starfish and um, trying to um, frame that um, so with the campuses that are involved in that. The scope of that again is not. Not just about online, but will certainly, um, I think, be advantageous, the work of that group, to what we're doing online and will help inform our, our overall strategy. Um, and then I also want to talk about the concierge community. Terry um, Van Vallis and Michelle Ford have been doing a great job um, convening that group regularly. The focus has been mostly about sharing amongst um, the campuses, what they're doing, what's working, and how are they, particularly the new campuses that are bringing online the concierge model, how is that working, and what lessons can they share with others. We're going to hear from some of them later this morning if I keep going. <laughs> Um, technology contracts quickly. Um, really great news to share on Smarter Measure. So um, we went back to them because our contract for Smarter Measure ended um, this past January. We Doug Cohen um, was able to negotiate with them for unlimited um, licenses that we're funding from Open SUNY for all campuses that want to use Smarter Measure. So um, I know some of the Open SUNY Plus campuses have been benefiting from that, but we're actually rolling that out now to all campuses. So that's our online readiness tool. If any of your campuses are interested in that, um, you know, please let us know. You can contact Terry, Michelle, or Doug. Um, Starfish Hobson, so that contract is in um, the final stages with council, um, and as soon as that's ready um, to send out to campuses, we'll let you know. Um, uh, some um, updates on Blackboard. Um, so we, I think we um, sent a communication to the community a couple of weeks ago now that we have new contacts at, at um, Blackboard. They have restructured their client services team. So we have a, um, a new um, contact, Ken Smith, um, uh, who is our account rep. Um, Doug has been meeting with him regularly. Um, uh, he and um, uh, I believe it's a new C CEO are coming to system in March to meet with us. And we are going to be um, uh, making, um, uh, trying, trying to get very concrete with them about um, product roadmaps and how changes that they're planning are going to affect our campuses. Um, Doug is continuing to share information as we have it. Um, they will also be at CIT. Um, we just heard yesterday they're going to be a platinum sponsor. Yay. Um, so um, please, um, you know, um, come with your questions. We are hoping to have opportunities for campuses to engage with them prior to CIT, but, you know, that always comes down to a scheduling opportunity. So um, so that's where we are with Blackboard. And then on faculty supports, which is probably a good one to end on, um, um, I'm really happy to announce that um, we have been working hard on a new SLA for COAT. Um, we heard from many of you that... Um, uh, you wanted us to go back to providing an annual training offering for your campus. Um, and so um, after some focus groups that we did a um, month or a month and a half ago, um, we took all the input that was provided to us and um, are very close to a new SLA, which will outline all the services from COAT that are available to all campuses for no cost. Um, there's still going to be um, quite a bit of that. But then we have added an annual training offering option for campuses who want to be able to pay up front for training of their campus faculty and staff. And then there are some additional um, what we're calling a la carte services for fee that we're hearing would be of interest to campuses um, that um, we're going to provide as well. So in this area in particular, we'd love um, uh, to get um, a group of campuses who are interested in this annual service offering to um, sit down with us, look at what we've put together, and give us your feedback before we finalize it. So if you're interested in doing that, let me or Alex or um, Dan know. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll find, try to find a time here to do that. 
Um, Alex referenced the new ambassador program. I'm not going to say a lot about that other than um, uh, I, we, we are really excited about this and really excited about those of you who are ambassadors to help us reach um, faculty who are not yet part of our community and who are not yet teaching online. To achieve the goals and the objectives that we have for Open SUNY, we need many more people involved in online teaching and learning. And so you're, we are hoping that you'll help us with that. And then Alex also referenced the research on faculty attitudes that Peter is going to be um, talking about later. I think that's, oh, that slide's not supposed to be in there because I talked about that already. I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Now I'm done. <laughs> okay. Do you want to just end there? Okay. Okay. Paul. I have one question on uh, financial stability. Yeah. And I love the idea that the one-size-fits-all charges are no longer apply because, you know, quite frankly, we were wasting resources there. But the problem is when we went to the a la carte shoes, it's the timing of yep. when you guys make the stuff available. And on the yep. community college level, let's say that you were planning on doing a program in April of 2017. I had to budget that in January of 2016. Yeah. So is there a way that you could possibly give us a timeline of so that we can get stuff well, like, in our you know, January, February budgeting. Yeah. And right now, I'm missing out on everything because yep. unless I can specifically tell them what I want, well, the budget's the way they are now. It's like, you got to tell me something specific. They're telling me exactly what they need the money for. Yep. And I'm getting turned down for everything. Sure. So we recognize that um, there may only be a small number of campuses who can opt into um, the things that we're providing for the coming year because we may have missed your cycle. Um, but I think um, for next year's cycle, it will be there in plenty of time for your budget planning. Um, and trust me when I tell you we've been working on this as hard as we can and as fast as we can with everything else that we're doing. The campus input piece of this was was incredibly important for us. Um, and so, so those focus groups that we held, um, um, were really helpful. And, um, and we want to make sure that we, we get another review with campuses before we finalize that. My hope is that, um, we'll be able to have a new, the SLA with the pricing options out this, um, coming month in March. So those of you who can take advantage of it for this year, we hope, you know, that, that you will. And we recognize that some of you may have to wait till next year. Chris. Kim, with regard to cultivating best practices, I mean, it's my understanding that the IITG grant program is really meant to achieve that goal. Um, I'm concerned that not a lot of folks either, you know, know about, if they know about IIT, IITG, they don't, aren't aware of, a lot, unless they go to CIT, um, yeah. about what's being produced through IITG. So yeah. I'm curious if there are maybe other w ideas in the works for um, doing more of that. I mean, I think we have, you know, an untapped, you know, number of faculty you could probably contribute to maybe doing some scholarship of teaching and learning around online yep. and that sort of thing. So yep. I, I was just wondering if there are other initiatives planned in that area or if it's just let's put all our eggs in the IATG basket. So uh, so this actually to me um, uh, cuts across, across a couple of things. These are some of the um, strategic questions that came up in the research area um, of which IITG is a part and, um, you know, how can we bring together the the research efforts within COAT, the research efforts of IITG, and uh, think more holistically about research and innovation in teaching and learning, and then, you know, the COAT focuses in online teaching and learning. Um, so I think we, we've talked a lot about opportunities to reach other faculty and about sharing outcomes. And I think Lisa um, Stevens, who's not here today, although I think she is online, so I'll give her a shout out, um, I think has the same um, question and concern. I'll say we have some ideas. Um, you know, I think we, we have the, um, the IITG site where the IITG outcomes are published. There is um, probably more that we can do to share that, as you said, beyond what we're doing at CIT. I do know that Aaron Maney, I'm looking for Aaron, um, has been looking for opportunities to pull 
pull some of those, um, there she is, <laughs> to pull some of the outcomes from that into COAT fellow chats and to highlight some of those um, with the COAT community. I think a challenge we have there is we're talking to, um, by and large, people who are um, already aware. And so we really need to expand the COAT community um, to, um, there's a role within COAT called Interested in Online. Um, I know many of you know about that. How do we get more faculty um, in that role who are not yet teaching online who maybe would be very interested in some of the things that are coming out of a lot of this work? So I think we're looking for the ways to tie all that together. Um, I mean, we have some ideas. Um, we probably haven't cracked the whole nut. Deb. Hi. A few questions or comments about Sarah. First, thank you for all your efforts. And I know Carrie Hatch has been very involved in that. It's really important to the campuses. So, so with that, um, well, the first thing is the fee to Sarah is going to be a hefty price for campuses with large FTE. That's a given. Is there going to be any kind of additional help or resources for that? And I guess the other question is, how is it going to work? Is it if we become part of Sarah, then I understand the administrative burden will be taken off the local campus, but for, it will only go for those states that are part of Sarah. That's so true. the other states that are not part, are we allowed as campuses to go, you know, if we have an agreement with those campuses to still work with them to provide distance ed to those states. So, I mean, this ties into the whole idea of increasing enrollment yep. and reaching out to the non-traditional population. Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, so um, I'm going to try and get all, get all your questions. There was a few there. Um, so the fee is hefty for um, campuses with large FTEs. Um, so the, the SARA fee is the SARA fee. I don't know that we have any hope of helping with that. Um, the state ed fee um, that uh, um, I shared is a range right now that they are projecting based on the number of campuses that they expect to participate in SARA. I think there is some thinking that if there are more campuses, that cost per campus could come down. But, you know, this is all, they're still working scenarios and models and trying to be helpful in terms of sharing some potential numbers right now. That's not the final number. Um, you know, we'll share that when that's known. Um, but it is a little bit of trying to anticipate how many and, you know, how do we share the cost that state ed's going to have over the projected number of campuses. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so that was one. Um, then the question about, um, uh, it will apply and it will take care of you for um, other states that are members of SARA, but states who are not yet members of SARA, um, you still, can you work with them separately? And I'm going to look at Carrie and Fred and say, I think they probably can and should, in fact, right? Yeah. So, yes. Did I get it all? Awesome. <laughs> what else? Okay. I really want to thank everybody. Oh, sorry, Chrissy. Sorry. Go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to reiterate about the fees for Sarah. Um, as a community college, um, I did put away money for it for next year. However, it wasn't nearly enough. And the state ed fee being higher than the actual Sarah fee, um, if, if you guys have any pull to talk with them, it's, it's just not happening for um, what's going on. I mean, we yeah. all have budget shortfalls, and we yep. were excited about being able to join this to be able to expand our programs. Yep. But it's just not going to happen with those fees. Yeah. So, Carrie, this, I mean, we, we are, um, said we would share this with our community and come back to state ed. Um, so we are happy to provide that feedback. Um, absolutely. Anything else you want to say on that, Carrie? Mike, microphone. Sorry. I, I actually have been very pleased with state ed's uh, responsiveness on this issue. Um, it's been, they've, they've actually been very good and very communicative. communicative. Um, they are looking for feedback. Um, so, you know, we just received the information about what they're looking at in terms of what it's going to cost them. Uh, you know, I encourage you to think about what you're saving yeah. because that, if you think about what you're not having to do anymore, it's not that bad. I know it's a dollar amount and you think personnel is sunk cost, but personnel can be redeployed and put into other areas. And, you know, so I think you are freeing up some resources unless you were doing nothing. Um, so I think there are some opportunities there, but certainly we'll take your feedback and we'll, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll provide it to, to state ed. And I, and I think, you know, similar to, um, uh, um, 
forget what I said this about, but if you're if you're not able to do it this year and you have to wait till next year, that's a decision you can make on your campus. You know, just because you don't you aren't able to come in the first year doesn't mean you're out of luck. Um, it's something that campuses will do on an annual basis. So, um, you know, you have to figure out what works for your campus. And again, we will provide the feedback to state ed. Um, so, thank you. Yes. Kim, you talked about smarter measure, and I might have missed this, but when is it available to campuses? So the new, the new, it's available now. The new contract is, um, I think, February 1st to January 30th next year. And, and do you know how the fee structure works? Is it by? The fee structure is we're paying for it and you get to use it. Does that work? That works. <laughs> So, you know, I just want to um, highlight that as an example of where we know um, that that has been um, determined to be an important thing on campuses as we do the institutional readiness. People are interested in that and talking about it. So it's the, one of the things that we're, when we get the, we get the decision to make, um, we have the decision to make where we focus the resources we get allocated to us by sysadmin. It was pretty um, um, reasonable cost for us to negotiate this with Smarter Measure. Again, I'm going to give Doug credit for that, um, to make it available to all of our campuses. So we're doing that. Yeah. Okay. Again, thank you everybody for being here and thank you um, for um, you know spending a little bit of time hearing about Open SUNY. I'm gonna be here for the whole um, uh, rest of the conference and, our, and, and others from our leadership team are here, um, Alex, Sandy, Michelle, Emily, who am I missing? Um, you know, Doug is back home, Terry is back home, Lisa um, is back home, but we um, are here to support you. Let us know how we can help, thanks.